Well, we'll let uh, Treva kick things off here. And uh, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks so much, guys, for joining. It's great to um, get you all together. It's nice to actually interact with people <laughs> during, like after hours for me anyway, and uh, can talk about things or different topics going on the channel and all that lovely stuff. So we're going to go into like peer groups. Um, so or Tom was recently at Evolve in Denver, um, the peer group. Uh, so I'd love to know, like, actually, I haven't spoke to you about it, Tom, like how you got on and um, if anyone else is here has, talk, has been, oh. what did you think of it? And what's the value you find in attending? Great. Yeah. So, I mean, what that's coming out of, I'm trying to keep these topics kind of close to home. What I'm seeing out there because I'm on the road a lot, like three weeks out of the month. And lots of great things. And, you know, I, I want to introduce everyone to Michael Nelson of Scaled and right. another company as well. And it's great. We hooked up like two weeks ago at IT Nation Evolve in Denver. And I was like, okay, this is a great topic. I did not have a lot of involvement with peer groups when I had an MSP. I, um, I a little bit, but not much. But I've had a lot of involvement on the vendor side. I worked with them at Axiant, some degree at Ninja, and now we're pretty involved with IT Nation Evolve, um, and, and now that I'm at Titan. And I just wanted to bring up, like, I, I really think peer groups are great. It allows people to connect. I One of the things I like about it that I see is the level of accountability you end up having to others in the group. And I know that, I know that for one, Michael's very involved, because I actually worked with their group at Evolve two weeks ago, and I'm sure there's others here too. So I wanted to kind of just go around the horn and see who wants to chime in and tell us why they're in peer groups, what they get out of them, what peer group they're in, and any recommendations. You want to pick someone? How about you, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was afraid that's how that was going to go. Um, so I've been in, I, I joined, it was back when it was called HTG. My MSP is about 18 years old, and I joined when we were probably five years old. Um, and it just changed everything about my business because I had this incredible group of people who did exactly what I did. Um, and we built the group to have a, an, an amazing amount of accountability. And that's been the biggest thing is that it's it's this board of directors of 10 other companies that I've been, we've been together, six of us, six or seven of us have been together almost 10 years now. Um, so we really know each other's businesses and lives and the accountability. We've we've taken it a step further. Evolve kind of has their way of doing things where they meet with regularity. We kind of took our group a step further and have uh, a much higher level of accountability that we do quarterly business reports before the meeting. Uh, they're usually two to four pages, just about everything. Everybody has to read each other's reports and actually post questions to go deeper because we just don't have enough time during the during the sessions. Then we get you know then we get vendors coming in that that present relevant topics. Um, it's it's it changed my margins, changed our profitability, changed our processes, how we do everything. We share a lot amongst each other. So somebody comes up with a good idea, they post it out to the group. Everybody steals it. It, it's probably the best thing I ever did for my MSP. Now, don't you also get buying power with vendors as well? Most of the time when they come in, they know that's going to be an expectation. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been involved in any other peer groups besides Evolve or HTG moved over to Evolve? Yeah. yeah, HTG moved over to Evolve. That's the one I've been for for the MSP. I've been involved. I'm involved in a couple of other mastermind groups as well. Um, but this one uh, evolved is specifically for MSPs. Yeah, and there's different levels, right? I mean, you're in a very high level one with uh, pretty much very high performing MSPs, mm -hmm. um, high growth, high high gross margins, and and that kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah, and that's that's part of the accountability. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, the nice thing about in Evolve. How many show of hands? How many people are in Evolve? Okay. Um, how, how many? How many even? How many people in peer groups at all? Okay. Okay, great. Awesome. So we got two other people to contribute. Right? The okay. the thing that is probably the most important that one of the things is the financial accountability. We have to enter in all of our financials into what's called SLI, sort of Service Leadership Index. So we get this amazing. You okay, Lori? You're shaking your head. You do the same thing in yours. It's 
some it's similar it's called something else but yeah. who, who created service leadership uh, uh paul dipple paul dipple yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so every quarter we can see each other compared to each other the group averages what's best in class for evolve what's best in class for the industry so it's a real you know because it's so easy to say well in my market it's like this but when you've got people all over the world uh, actually there's there's numbers out there that prove otherwise so it's it, it's just huge for the accountability is what i found it's great um hey, mark you raised your hand i mean well, are you in a peer group now and maybe you can tell us a little about that yeah, uh, I'm not in an MSP peer group. I'm actually in a broader, a broader entrepreneurial peer group, but I think okay. it does definitely has the same effect. Um, a lot of what you were talking about there with um, accountability, I think that's mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing. You don't you don't want to turn up to a group of other um, people who are maybe killing it, maybe not, but you know they say turning up and you've not done your homework. Uh, which, if you plan accordingly, you, you have to really start it pretty early you can't you can't rush that at the, at the end um you get found out but uh, one of the things i think is actually really valuable may, maybe it's i don't know if it's unique to the ms to, to the more broader entrepreneurial pers uh, kind of perspective probably not is you you're with different people who are all different stages of their journey and so you're learning you know okay i'm in this space it's not, sometimes it's not so good being around people that are in the same space as you because you don't really learn anything. You, you get validation probably, but you don't get necessarily inspiration or, okay, you know, this isn't going to work to take me to the next level. And similarly, you'll be ahead of other people and you can help pull them up and support them. So that's, that's why I think on top of everything that he said, it offers a lot of value being in peer groups. No, I didn't that, know about this. Is that, is that EO, Entrepreneurs Organization? No, no, uh, okay. part of the Scale Up Institute. Um, th there's uh, a number of, well, actually, there's not that many, but it's out, out of a number of the university um, entrepreneurial programs here. It's actually um, quite a number of successful Scottish and British entrepreneurs that have been in tech that have scaled, you know, companies like, or big, big games companies and, and so on that are big, uh, big advocates of it. Hmm. Sorry, Tom. Oh, go, go ahead. I mean, that sounded interesting. I didn't know how that would work when it's not like vertical specific, but it yeah. seems to work. I mean, what can you tell us real quick, what kind of other companies are in there with you that I mean, you mentioned one, but I mean, how, how broad is it? Yeah, uh, well, uh, in the, in the ones I'm involved in, there, there's there's a, a good handful of of um, of tech, you know, but they try not to let tech dominate it because of, it's the obvious one. So we've got um, We've got members of who are involved in um, robotics, who are involved in um, more traditional industries such as like uh, food and drink, um, like uh, tourism. Um, tourism's, an, tourism's an interesting one because they have all different challenges, right? So, for example, during the pandemic, some of us, like like us, uh, were thriving, where some of them were dying, you know. But then, as as it came as it came back around you know those industries are booming what i find very interesting is actually how many industries have a tech spin on them so you know, i think the obvious one like market and technology or sales technology but you know like food tech is a thing who'd, who'd have known but it's actually an industry uh, and there's all these little side industries that you have you have no idea about so try to digitize them but blend blend like new thinking with 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 old thinking so you, you see these different challenges being solved in innovative ways but then sometimes you're better like going back to the old way you know like looking and some businesses in our cohort are for manufacturing uh some of the traditional ways of thinking like, like kanban for example right how can that be implemented in an msp that's a very interesting topic uh probably not one for this call but it gets you thinking about how old ways and other ways can be implemented you know sometimes old ways are the best and and new new kind of textile businesses great and and Lori, uh what is what is the peer group called you're in i don't know if i caught that oh, so i'm in a i'm in a couple so uh i started i started my own facebook group many years ago uh when i started hosting events because i wasn't aware of all the other peer mm -hmm. groups that were around in the industry 
somehow I missed those memos or emails or finding out about uh, the, the different ev the different peer groups at events that I was at. So I think that's one level of a peer group because you can ask questions and you're not always an island and it, but there's no true accountability, uh, you know, because you're just you're just posting in a group, but at least you have some camaraderie of your peers. And then I am involved with Taylor Business Group and James Kiernan's uh, peer group. So I'm involved with both of those. Wow. So Taylor Business Group, I think, is similar to the, and has been mm -hmm. around, I think, yep. around the same time period as the, the one that you're involved with. Was your name Michael? No. Michael, yeah. Michael it is, okay. Sorry, let me change that name. <laughs> did you so did, did you have a recommendation yeah. of, of, what, of where you would go? Because it sounds like you really been around with the different peer groups if you were looking into it now and, and wanted to try one out? Well, I, th I think it depends what you're trying to get out of the different peer groups and how much time you have to put into the peer groups. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't join a peer group because I need accountability. I hold myself uh, accountable like every day. I put myself under uh, probably too much pressure to achieve and acquire goals, but I I joined a uh, Taylor business group because they had the KPIs and because I loved Dennis O'Connell. I liked meeting Dennis. Mm -hmm. I liked going to their event when I first went to it. I was invited by one of my vendors to attend and it was very similar with how, how I ran my event. And so I liked the people that were there and I liked how it was really, it was a, a group run by the members and everyone wanting you to be better than where you were today. And they had all those KPIs. So I didn't know, was I doing okay for my business or was I not doing okay? Rather than I, didn't, remember, I didn't have any um, benchmarks to go up against. Also important to remember, remember that all right. That was. So yep. for me, I think it depends on what you're looking for. I, I was looking to learn more about my financials and about where I stood amongst my peers and you know, comparing myself comparing my numbers to myself and how I was doing. So I, I think it depends what you're trying to get out of it. Great, that's great to hear. And uh, Matt, you and I talk all the time. I didn't know you were involved in peer groups. Yeah, we, we almost talk too much, Tom. Um, no, not really, I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm not uh, involved in peer groups in the traditional sense. You know, that's something that's more along the lines of George, the president here at Valiant. He's a part of service leadership. And, you know, we always have our meetings afterwards. And I, I'm always strangely excited to hear about any changes in OML scores and what's been learned. And, you know, everyone gets beaten up a little bit. So you get to hear about that. And you get to hear about the wins. And that's awesome, especially for an owner of an MSP. Uh, when it comes to me, I think that I've found that just kind of finding circles of people with things in common helps a lot. It doesn't address the accountability side, but it does give you people to talk to. It exposes you to different points of views, uh, different solutions to similar problems that people are having. And I think that, you know, when you get into these kinds of circles and you have conversations, uh, the ideas start to flow between companies and someone that you may have seen as a competitor is not really seen that way anymore. I mean, this morning, I've probably talked between this morning and today, I've probably talked to like 20 different MSP owners and like seven or eight different marketers. And a lot of it's how you do and what's going on today. What are you working on? It's, you know, swapping ideas back and forth. And that's where a lot of really great stuff happens. I mean, look at it this way, Tom. Had Jonathan Crow over at Ninja never reach out to me back in 2019, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. And that's that was, right. That was a form of peer exposure that he really kicked off for me that led down a path of getting to meet a ton of people in the industry. And I think that reinvigorating my interest in the work that was being done. So being in the in the right circles of people, finding folks that you have things in common with, finding folks that you don't have things in common with, and really kind of having great conversation with them that's engaging and leads to positive things is I think a critical factor of success within the industry, regardless of what your position is, uh, whether you're an owner or you're someone working with an owner, it doesn't matter. The fact is, is that we should all be exposed to peers, people that have a lot of things in common, that have some differences, you find your middle grounds and a lot of great things come from that. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, the, the, you're talking to the informal peer groups that develop mm -hmm. and then sometimes you formalize them. I mean, I'm, I've been on the vendor side now for five years and I'm finding that we have these informal groups and I'm actually working with Matt Solomon of the channel program to formalize one because he and I are both in the DC area and there's an enormous amount of technology that comes out of the DC area because of the three letter agencies in particular. 
So we're actually building a, a like the DC Metro Vendor Alliance group and having regular meetings there. And we hope to then morph that into some type of event in the future that where we actually then in, incorporate MSPs into some of the things we do. But, it's, you know, there's things you can do. It sounds like, Lori, you've had some experience with that as well, kind of starting your own thing and turning that into a peer group. Uh, yes, and I love Matt and how he comes up with stuff. He's actually the vendor that invited me when he was at ID Agent yeah. over to the to the Taylor Business Group because he's like, I think you may like this. This is very much similar to yours, and and I had never heard of Taylor Business Group before. So I I think it's it's great when you just like what Matthew was saying when someone else that you work with, maybe a vendor, or maybe a peer, tells you about something, but it really takes you taking the action to participate and to at least take that first step forward um, to get involved. So, Well, great. I think that's a good way to close out the topic. And um, I know we have a next topic that carries on very well from this. Trevo? Yeah. Yeah. I was just about to say the exact same thing. I think this kind of ties in so nicely with um, my next topic of events. So just to give you a background, I um I've been in Titan for about a year and a half now, and my background is marketing and events. So I'm relatively new to the channel. So I'm still trying to learn like what events are good, where it wants to go to. So I'd love to hear like, what are your favorite events to go to? Um, maybe go around the horn, like your favorite events and like, what, like, what do you get out of them? Like, why do you go? And like, what's the reason for selecting different events? I'll start off. I, I know for me, I like going to the events because I like to interact with my peers. And most importantly, I like to hear how the vendors, when they're speaking on stage, how they're talking about various solutions uh, to how we should be positioning ourselves when we're speaking to our clients. You learn key phrases, key words, new, new, new terms that you can utilize. So that's why I like going to events to just pick up a, a couple key. I don't know, key golden nuggets of information that I can then use and implement in my business. Look, are you going, really going, good, are you going to Big Big? I am going to the Big Big. I'm going to speak at oh. the Big Big. Oh, great. Uh, wow. I have a little little session. And then I'm also going to uh, to DattoCon too. So those are nice. my two Oh, we'll see you at DattoCon, definitely. Yeah. yeah, we'll be there. What, do you, what are you speaking about at Big Big? I'm going to be speaking about some marketing, uh, just newer, innovative ways that you can use that you can market your business or market yourself as the founder to to your peers, to your community. Really, it's just about you know how you're positioning yourself and putting yourself out there based upon the work that I've done in the last couple of years and how it always brings in new business, even though I may not be doing much now. But when I do post about different items and you know on social media, I'm always able to to gain new clients utilizing the different tools. So That's amazing. So I know that I know that uh I, I'm very curious about events outside the US. I've never been to any. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping next year to attend some, you know, in Europe for Titan, but I know we have we have two people over in, you know, over on that side here on the call, both Treva and Mark. And um I know I know what Treva's going to, of course, but um but uh, Mark, uh, Mark, I know you recently went to an event, I think in the UK, right? And then and you, maybe you can tell us a little about those, maybe how they're different or what you have coming up. Yeah, uh, I went uh, recently down to uh, Infosec Europe. Oh, yeah, uh, we actually, we um, had a yeah. stand there, actually. How did you find yes. it? <laughs> oh, man, it was overwhelming. It, like Really? <laughs> I felt, I said to Tom when I got back, I felt like I'd just been beaten over the head by every marketing department in the world. Like, that's what, that's what I, we feel, I felt violated by the time I left. <laughs> but, I think it was anyway. quite unfortunate that day because there was a tube strike, so it wasn't yeah. there, so there wasn't a huge amount there. Oh, yeah. I, um, I know a few people who went on the following day and they said it was pandemonium. Like, you just couldn't. Really? You couldn't move. When I went there, I felt like I was being hunted down because there were so many reps on the stand. There was the stand for the reps was longer than the stand for the guests. So you went around corners and people like kick footballs at you and you know like throw things in your hand. I was like, I just need to get out of here. But I mean, it was awesome. It was really good to see these vendors and um, I got there was somebody from Google 
he sat me down and, and they were doing a presentation. There was nobody there. I was like, why do I need to sit down? She's like, oh, sit down, sit down, come watch this. I'm like looking around me like I'm the only person here. <laughs> but they just kicked the presentation off anyway. And then I was like, it's like magic. Everybody just appeared and started watching. It's like she must have known what she was doing. I felt I felt like an idiot sitting in that seat on my own. <laughs> I wasn't on my own by the end. But um, in the UK, I think most of the events uh, are are like that, or or are predominantly being run by CompTIA and mm-hmm. by ConnectWise. Com- ConnectWise have quite a presence. I get invited to their events all the time. Um, and up in Scotland specifically, we have a division of the Scottish government who promote a lot of cyber and tech. The problem with that, though, is they don't they don't really promote it like to MSPs or to vendors. They, they try to promote it for education. So there's a big government influence in what they teach. So the ConnectWise and the CompTIA ones are obviously really good. Do you know what's mm. funny? Because this week, um, one of my tasks was <clears> trying <throat> to find new events. And I found it very hard to find. It's found it very easy to find lots of American events, but a lot harder to find uh, European events. Um, yeah. But we'll definitely, we'll definitely be at CompTIA in London. So hopefully we'll see you there. Yeah, I'm going to be seeing you on the stand again. Well, Treva, Treva <laughs> Mayor, Nana, we're, well, I'm trying to get Treva to come over uh, early uh, for IT Nation Connect and come over like two weeks or a week and a half earlier and go to Robin Robins Vegas with me. But yeah. we're, we're, she's kind of split. We're figuring that out. Is it Channel Con oh, in the that's UK? Right, or is it that? They kind of clash. There's a day or two yeah. clash. So it's going to be it's going to be a battle. <laughs> yep. and, uh, Which one uh, in? Vegas or London? <laughs> <laughs> I know where I'd be going. I tell everyone my favorite events are I, I like we get the best results as vendors at Orlando or Vegas and those two mm-hmm. like we, we seem to get they're more destinations and so as a result we seem to we seem to have the best results the best turnout for those events and they work mm-hmm. out well but Michael so you and I met at Evolve kind of mm-hmm. different not really a trade show peer group event but a large one uh, what else do you have? Do you have anything else planned for the rest of the year for events? So typically in tell COVID, we went to uh, Microsoft Inspire, which I found really, really helpful. Oh, sorry. That's where, that's where we got a lot of information about Office 365, what's coming down the, the pipeline. It also, you know, early on, even though we had a good partnership, it's so hard to get information. And so that's where you actually get direct reps inside of Microsoft, you get their business cards, you get their names, you actually have a real person you can talk to when you hit a wall. Um, so we did that. I uh, did, you know, quarterly, we did the Evolve, which is a pretty big time commitment, but we also got exposure to a lot of vendors that way. They always have kind of the vendor booths, so we can meet with the different vendors, which is nice. Um, and then IT Nation, that one, you know, that one's kind of been hit or miss. The last year that I went to that, it seemed like, you know, Mark, you were talking about the vendors chasing you. It seems like right now, uh, so many of the things are focused on M&A. So it's either geared towards the MSPs that are kind of starting out and trying to build their business up or trying to get rid of it and sell it at the end. Um, So I'm hoping to see, we're going back to IT Nation this fall, hoping to see that. On a different note, actually, there's a Robin Robbins um, High Producers Club in North Carolina, October 13, 14, I think, uh, or 12, 13. We're going to be going 13, 14. We're going to be going to that one as well. Great. Right. There's, there's one other one that I go to. Uh, at least I started going to it a couple of years ago before COVID. And it's a, a cybersecurity event for enterprise companies. And the reason why I like going to that is you hear really high level people at some of the enterprise companies. And again, learning new terminology. I remember when password hygiene, that terminology was being used. Mm-hmm. I remember my husband saying, you can't use that word. No, one, no one's using that. <laughs> that, that event. So I think that's what's coming down the pipeline. So yep. I think when you go to some of these other events that maybe not be geared towards MSPs, but even at the enterprise level, actually met Jonathan Crow at one of those events uh, and took a picture with him. And I'm like, I know I know you from somewhere and <laughs> from that event. But uh, I, I think you can see then if it's affecting the larger corporations, it may not be affecting us yet, but it's going to be starting then to trickle down. So you just learn different terminology and 
different tools that may start becoming available uh, for for the smaller businesses and that at the enterprise level. Go, going to an enterprise event is the equivalent of jumping in a time machine that takes you forward six to 18 months. Oh, that's a really good analogy. I like yeah, that. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Um, uh, one, yeah. Other, one other one, Tom, is GlueCon, I think it's called. Mm. I don't go to yeah. that, but the president, my, my, uh, the president of my MSP goes to it. Yeah, that's and to say. Yeah. Very, yeah. yeah well, I've, I've was, been to that one before. Okay. That was before. I think the last time he went was before Kaseya Bottom, back when they were still independent. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting to see the changes. I think that's merged with um, Danocon this year, actually. Yeah. I think so. Uh, what about, about, sorry, go ahead. Event. No, Kaseya did a big event in Las Vegas. I think it was in August. They do two um, large events a year like that one. We did, we did Jim yeah. and Kaseya like Connect IT. IT was in MGM in, in Vegas. We were there. Yeah, that was the one. Mm -hmm. Oh, were you there, Jody? No, uh, I found out about it at the last minute, and ah. it was just like one of those. There are no reasonably priced hotel rooms. I'm not going. Yeah, like it's, <laughs> it, it, it would have been a scramble to go, and it was yeah. going to cost too much. <laughs> it's taking place in April this year, actually. So, or next year, I should say. Okay. A little bit earlier. I'll keep my eye open. We're going to DadoCon and the it nation this connect what was which one is the, i we just call it it nation but it's the the big one yes um, uh, connect or connect. yeah i go to little regional things i'm the the rest of the company is up in the boston area and i'm in north carolina so a lot of things happen near here in raleigh or charlotte and it's just like get in the car and and go to a thing mm -hmm. for an afternoon um so i've been doing that just to meet other uh, you know, meet the vendors, but also meet the other um, MSPs. There, 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 there are no way competition. So we, they're different part of the country. I work remotely and we just like, hey, are you using this this way? What are you doing for this? Like we bounce all kinds of ideas off each other. And we do the networking. So that's that's been great to meet people. I, I absolutely love the, the peer exposure of working with other MSPs in that sense. I mean, like right now I'm working with three others on a content package for October. It's pretty cool yes. to think that we've got yeah. other MSPs, you know, we're, we're collaborating on collaboration content. We're each <laughs> taking a portion uh -huh. of it. And then the way that we collaborate becomes behind the scenes content to show other people in the audience how they should collaborate. So you've got like this meta thing going on and that's not possible without these types of interactions. Yeah. Well, I can give you guys a quick rundown of where we're going to be. And if it gives you any ideas or anyone has any questions, but I've got quite a schedule here. I've got uh, Robin Robbins, Philly next week. Uh, and then I've got a little break until SMB Forum DC. That's like Channel Pro Network and Treva's coming out for that. Mm -hmm. And then we will be at DattoCon. And then um, I'm doing the Channel Strong bus tour on the September 26th through 30th. Then I've got Robin Robbins Orlando on October 6th and 7th. Team Logic Owners Summit in Phoenix, October 12th and 13th. Robin Robbins Roadshow Houston, October 19th. I've got Robin Robbins Roadshow Vegas, the uh, November 2nd and 3rd. IT Nation Evolve, the 7th and through something. And then IT Nation Connect. Mm -hmm. So. So you're and saying um, that the next few yeah. months you've got nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I'm back for three days after IT is going to go to Israel for 10 days on vacation. Hmm. Oh. But you know what I found um, since joining Titan and since like, so obviously the events only really kicking off this year is like the common theme that I'm learning from each event is uh, it's kind of I've kind of noticed it here as we're chatting as well is the community and like it's I actually can't believe it. Like, I don't I don't know what I was expecting, but like everyone everyone I speak to um, I'm sure you will find the same like they're all so willing to help and like want to learn from each other and it's honestly like joining a, a huge company where you don't know everyone because you go in mm -hmm. and you meet you see different similar faces but you're trying to remember their names and it's and a lot of times a lot of people uh, at a lot of the same events but that's what I just my key takeaway is why I love going to all these events is the community is just amazing it's just so nice yeah absolutely and I just want a question. I, I got Lucas and Rodrigo. I wanted to see if you two have any events you've been to you really liked. Are you going to any? Do you have any questions about upcoming events? We're here to give advice about them as well. Oh, like um, 
to be honest, like I haven't been in any uh, events so far, but um, like working with MSPs, like uh, I have the same feeling and the he same feedback from from you guys in terms of the community, you know. So they help, they like to help each other. They want to discuss their barriers. They want to discuss what they are facing as a challenge and say, "Hey, I have hit on this before." That's so much advice that you can go through, you know. So that's the like. I'd say like that's the cherry and the cake to be honest guys uh for mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. uh, industry and has been great huh yeah, yeah for it's... me it's it's the same i've never been you know in any of those but i recently joined the company so i'm still trying to learn uh yesterday was my first day so i'm excited <laughs> to have these <laughs> contacts with the msps as well and you know share the same uh you know, situation that you guys just mentioned it. It should be awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty excited. But yeah, hopefully I'll I'll have the chance to join one of those as well. Great. Where and we also have oh, go ahead. Sorry. Where where are you located? Uh on Goey. In Ireland. Goey, Ireland. Yeah. Ireland. Oh, yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that wasn't a New Jersey accent. Uh, <laughs> 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 hey, uh, Tom, Tom, real quick, because I, I think that you you'll dig this. You know, we're talking a lot about you know, uh, working with peers and learning and sharing. And I think that sometimes it's it's really valuable that that tends to at times transcend the sense of business. I mean, just like a really quick story. And I mean, Tom, you know, uh, Dan Comis of TechRunner here uh, on Long Island is a smaller MSP. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was doing a live stream for Valiant and I didn't realize that I was physically going downhill on the stream. Like my eyes were, you know, I was starting to look sick. And uh, no one really said anything, but once the stream was over, he called me on my cell phone and goes, there's something wrong. Look at yourself in the mirror. You're not feeling well. What do you need? And I brushed it off, but then I went and got a COVID, you know, one of those, uh, the COVID tests 10 minutes later, positive. And wow. um, I, I think that's awesome. That's the kind of um, camaraderie and backup and, and just looking out for each other that I think um, as humans, we need. That's really Absolutely. Good. Yeah, you really get to know people on the road. I'll tell you that events I was at um, Build It, and then the next week at ChannelCon, the next week at Evolve. <laughs> Let me tell you, some people were pretty rough <laughs> by the end of Evolve. I was like, I mean, I was pretty tired. I when I got home, I literally was like two days. I didn't leave my house, I didn't leave the property, but uh, I tried to take care of myself. And that's one of the things on the road. It can it can beat you up pretty bad because the late nights and and the partying and all that and getting it starting today at 7 a.m., finishing at midnight, but uh, but it is worth it. We, Trim and I were talking about it earlier. It's like a vacation for me, even though I'm working. I, I love it. Yeah. Obviously, obviously that schedule, I wouldn't take that schedule on if I didn't enjoy it. For sure, it's so fun. I love meeting people. Can I ask you guys a question? Because Dad O'Connell will be my first big event. Any advice for people who have been to big events before? I've just done Wear comfortable little... shoes. <laughs> yeah, I wear. Yeah. That, yeah, I wear I wear all I have all Echo shoes, so really high end. Like they make for women too, but ergonomic dress shoes, and I use those because it saves my feet. And people all the time are like, "My feet are killing me." I'm like, "Mine aren't." That's Jeez. one thing. And the other thing is, when you book, when you register for it, as soon as you hear about an event you want to go to, go on and book the hotel immediately mm -hmm. because the room blocks get filled up or the hotel gets filled up. And for example, DattoCon, as soon as we knew we were going to go. I think we hadn't even signed the paperwork yet. I did the hotel accommodations and I got the Marriott Marquis in DC. And, you know, everyone I know is filling up now is in, like the embassy suites and like the Fairfield Inn and stuff like that. And I'm staying at one of the best hotels in, in DC at the same price. So that's some, that's a little trick when you know you're going to go because you can always cancel a hotel reservation and there's no penalty. So even before you're signed up for the actual show, get mm -hmm. that hotel booking. I'm just going to point out that we can tell Tom, uh, Tom is a very technically inclined individual because he shared the specifications of his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's important because you have to be comfortable at these things. I've never been at a at an industry event within this industry, but I used to go to a lot uh, with when when I, when I was in the publishing industry, and you'd walk around with the vendors, you get to know people. By the time you're done with six or eight hours of that, you just want to sit down and and and, and collapse. Yeah. And I mean, all joking aside, having the right pair of footwear and I go with Forrest Gump's recommendations. You always have to have a fresh pair of socks. It makes a huge difference because it's going to keep that pep in your step at the end of the day. And that's when the interesting peer interactions begin to happen. Oh, yeah. yeah. More, more, more things happen after hours in terms of business mm -hmm. connections and probably during the yeah, day. Yeah, so true, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah. And definitely my advice is go around the vendor tables and see who's got the like the not the hangover packs but like the health packs because they always have like plasters like you know like the liquid ivs paracetamol like that's that's my trick because you know it, it's hard when you're on your feet all day long to try to stay going and you know you want all the energy because you know you're only going to be there for two or three days or two days even so uh, i definitely make the most of the other vendors <laughs> little health packs <laughs> yeah and that that make, gives you one more point before it finishes up is that and, and, and treva knows this I have a rule. If you go to an event with me, there is none of this stuff. Like after the, after the exhibitor hall is closed, you're up in your room. No, you got to go to everything at the event. Yeah. I see people go to events and you'll see some people do like these little side things where they take a bunch of people off site. I try to avoid those. I tried to do the actual event activity. So at DattoCon, the big one is the nationals event. And um, my mm-hmm. friend, George Bardisi, channel strong, MSP initiative, they've rented out national stadium for the night. And we're going to have it to ourselves and like, free drinks and games and play stuff like that but you'll see other groups will take people over to a bar or restaurant and separate them out and i'll tell you if you stay within what what's going on for the event you're going to meet more people and make more connections and i think it's more valuable i mean if if, if it's not as important and someone wants to go to a dinner and that that individual relationship is more important to you then go for that but if you want to get more exposure to more people try to do what the event has planned and plan on staying up late. I mean, it makes the difference business-wise, the connections you make. And the pre-day events are always a great icebreaker as well. They are. Yeah, those are good to do. DattoCon on Sunday has like a boot camp going on, that kind of thing. We're not involved with that, but, you know, if you see value in that kind of thing, it's probably worth registering and coming a day early. That's a great tip you put in there, Laurie, about planning your schedule, especially when it's a big event um mm-hmm. like even looking back to say like there was so many talk tracks and everything on so having a set schedule and knowing your way around makes it a little bit easier and not having to get lost and and all of that yeah I and think the one, other joe if you're so, an introvert at all like i am uh you know there's the the like at it nation there's so many things to do throughout the day and there's usually one block that it's like eh, i'm not sure it's like okay that's my downtime i'm gonna go back to the hotel yeah and, and that's why Here being on the property <laughs> And just having that time to just have 45 minutes, turn the phone off, no email, not talking to people, just kind of get your brain reset so you can go out and do it all again. Just yeah, that's gonna, a good point, Michael. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. I'm just going to throw one other thing that out. And it, it's actually, this came from one of Matt Solomon's streams maybe like a month or two ago when they were talking about branded apparel. Um, if you're going to one of these events, it's probably a good idea to leave a little space reserved in your luggage for the things that are going to come back from uh-huh. the vendors. Because yeah, you're going to have t-shirts, you're going to have lovely Titan HQ bags, hopefully with chocolates um, and other things. But then, um, you know, sometimes you'll see like the cowboy hat that's got the uh, the LEDs on it and you just have to take it home with you. You're going to need space. You can't just get yeah. on the plane with the thing on your head. It's not going to go well. Um, so all, like, seriously, that's that's one of the things that I pulled away from one of their webinars not too long ago. And I think that that's, that's great because you go and you're going to pick up all these little bits and pieces of marketing materials and everything else. And they're designed to keep, you know, those brands top of mind. And if you want them, take them home, but just make sure you got the space to do so properly. Yeah, Matthew, if, if you work in it, go ahead. So I was just going to say, Jody and guys, when you're coming to Dalcom, make sure you come over to us. I'll, I'll bring something special for you guys. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and Matthew, you know, you point out, I mean, if, if you work at an MSP, I can tell you, if you gather up some swag and shirts and stuff like that and the tchotchkes, bring them back. The techs in particular love this yep. stuff. They oh, eat yeah. it up. And a lot of vendors, if you tell them, hey, listen, I want to take back a number of those for my techs, they will hand you whatever you want when they hear that. <laughs> tell I was going to say, tell you them. guys have the best pens. I got a little welcoming packet when I onboarded a product. Your pens are like oh, the yeah. best. <laughs> this pen right here, right? I am. That's yeah. my proud. Um, Wait, yeah, they're really good. Yeah, I got around pens? my desk. I use every day. Wait, wait, hold on a second. I was very particular of ordering them pens. You, you, you guys give <laughs> out pens and all I get is chocolate? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I ran out of pens. I used them all, but I'll bring some over. But I remember right. I used these pens previously and I was like, I cannot order a pen and not, for, it has to be this one because it's just so good. <laughs> so nice. And that, it's always the Titan HQ pen. <laughs> oh, I love it. Exactly. love it. <laughs> So I know we have one more topic here, and I want to introduce it by telling you also, I'm at Evolve last week and having this great conversation at dinner with, with Michael here, who's on the call, and he tells me he's a very successful MSP, and then he tells me this story about, you know, 
his prior views of remote workers and and how that has changed and then staff augmentation. So maybe, Michael, maybe you could pick up from here and kind of tell people what you, you told me because it really caught my interest enough that I thought it was worth making it a topic and bringing you on because it had such value to MSPs. So uh, my MSP is 18 years old now, and I had bought the office building that we're in, and I had always been, we had been on-prem, period, end of story, non-negotiable. My techs had been after me for years. Hey, let us work from home one day. Let us do this sometimes. I'm like, nope, not a chance, never going to happen, non-negotiable. I just had this very old school, you needed to be in the office, otherwise you were not going to be as efficient. <laughs> Fast forward to March of 2020, we started uh, warning our clients that they needed to get prepared. And of course, nobody did. So we kept warning and kept warning. Well, we decided, okay, we've got to do the test. So we went home actually a week before California shut down. And it turned out we became more efficient, more profitable, happier techs. It just changed everything. And then, of course, we had problems getting texts because everybody was getting picked up, the whole great resignation, all of that. We ended up started uh, having some texts from South Africa work remotely. And we picked South Africa because they're native English speaking. A uh, little bit of a British accent, but they did well. And that started going really well. Uh, we got up to about three texts from South Africa and found out that they... We're being paid as independent contractors, not as employees like we thought, which meant they had no unemployment, they had no vacation, no sick days, no holidays. So if they got sick, they didn't make money. And so a lot of them would never call in sick even when they weren't. It just, it's not how as an MSP we wanted to, to that's, that's not how we roll. And so we looked around for a solution uh, couldn't find one that was set the way we wanted. So we ended up starting another company um, called Scaled, which does staff augmentation. Um, and the same way we're, we provide techs to MSPs for a flat monthly fee, um, same kind of thing. But what we found is we've got a group of techs that the, the really amazing thing is we typically get to increase their pay 20 to 30% over what they're making now, sometimes even 40% more. And we can provide them for about 30 to 40%, sometimes even more than that, the cost of an employee in the US. And they just have this amazing work ethic. Um, so it's just changed our world. We're now 27 in my MSP and currently seven of them are from South Africa. And, and U.S. dollars are worth a lot there, right? I mean, because of the way oh, the exchange rate works, yeah, it's worth a ton yeah, of money. Yeah, yeah. It's just, and again, we we can get them for less than we're than we typically would pay for an equivalent in California, but they, they get to get a raise, which is really part of the cool cool thing as well. So it's kind of a win win all the way around. Now I know I work. I know I deal with the time difference because I work for an Irish company, and I'm the mm -hmm. only marketing person in the U.S. How does that kind of translate over to what you're dealing with with that? These people just adjust their schedules completely? Yeah, yeah, they adjust their hours and they're typically more than happy. Nobody's ever had a problem with it. That's just part of the game. They understand that. And they have the, you're finding they have the skill set that we're used to as MSPs here in the US? So MSPs are not quite, so MSPs in South Africa are where our industry was probably at about 2015. So it was starting to get much more, you know, MSP is a term, you, you know, you don't have to explain it hardly anymore in the US, but that's, it's about where we were in about 2015. So about 20% of our, uh, of the people that apply have had some level of MSP experience. A lot of them are coming out of enterprise, either banking, mining, um, tel telco, but they come out with some really strong sysadmin or, or networking skills is what we have found. Great. But I mean, just I, like I with, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just like with any, you know, we, uh, sure, we all want to hire people that have worked at other MSPs before. And typically, you know, when, when we were hiring strictly out of the U.S., we were still finding that 
20 percent of the people that applied had MSP experience, especially when they needed to be on premise. But with the ability to go remote, it just opens up, whether it's remote US or remote overseas, it just opens up a world, world of opportunities. Now, I think you were explaining to me that this is not like level one level. This is higher level text. You're, you're like you're, you're sitting in a, a, like a sweet spot where MSPs need like, you know, these better texts rather than trying to have tickets go up level one, level two, level three. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. So we only do we're doing level two and level three texts um, and the, the skill sets. It's, again, they're well trained. Interesting is the amount of certs that they often have. Um, I would say 50 to 60% of them come in with Microsoft certs because um, they just, they love, it, it's just part of the culture is that that's how they prove their worth to their employer. Great. That's great, Michael. I was wondering if anyone else has any questions for Michael or any thoughts about remote work, questions how, because he, he kind of, it sounds like beyond what a lot of people figured out during the pandemic, he kind of cracked the code to a next level. And that's why I wanted him on. He, he's brought not only his experience in MSP, but all the way to where he can help other MSPs leverage what he learned. Yeah, Michael, we've we've done the same. Uh, I've worked with a number of South, South Africans and I would second what you've said. Um, yeah. Awesome work ethic, um, definitely certified. I think you find that broadly um, uh, across Eastern Europe as well. We've been really successful yeah. with individuals in Eastern Europe, even our team. Now, MSP, we've just a little less than you. We've got about twenty-two, uh, but we've got we've got engineers in in uh, Romania, Serbia, Ukraine, um, and also we've got an engineer in India as well. But it just it adds a whole new dynamic to the, to the team. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have, are are afraid. That that's the problem. I don't know what it's like over in the US, but over here there was definitely a a bad name to people overseas for a while with all the call centers getting shipped out offshore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that was, that was and a that's, problem. yeah, that's really, and that's one of the reasons we've started with South African is because they're native English speaking, <clears throat> right or wrong. When they started doing outsourcing overseas, they did it wrong. It was these large telcos or the Comcast, AT&T, and they just built these massive call centers where people just went through a basic book script. So it just became this, you had to go through all this bureaucracy and it just kind of gave outsourcing a really bad name. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I, I gotta be, it's funny that I started a company that does, uh, you know, staff AUG using remote workers because I was so <laughs> against it as an owner of an MSP, but it just, the other part of it, the, the flip, so there's the side of finding them, but then the, the more important side is how do you incorporate them into your culture and really make sure that they're truly an extended part of your team. You know, people's fears are typically what, what we hear the most is, you know, how am I going to make sure they maintain my culture? Um, and, and there's really easy ways to do that. One of the things, I, I, the guy who the, is the president of my MSP now, he just, it, it's really kind of shocking what he did. But one day, early on, on a Friday, we started doing uh, Netflix lunch movies. So we'd watch a movie over a couple of Fridays over lunch and have it synchronized for everybody. And that was in the Netflix room in Teams. And awesome. then he just started saying, hey, I'm going to be in the Flix room. And then it became the Flix room. Uh, one day he was having tacos for lunch. So now it's called the taco room. It's like, <laughs> hey, I'm going to be in the taco room. And people go in and out of that room all day long. So when the techs are in between calls or they're working on something in the background, they'll just kind of hang out in the room. And it's, it's like being in the office. So I'll walk in sometimes and I'll see people on the screen, you know, out of 20, 27 employees, we got 10, 15 that are hanging out in the room. And it gives the text the ability to ask a question as well. So it makes it really easy. We do a daily huddle where they have to share stories, where we really, really talk a lot about our, our, um, our values and what our core values and how, you know, we tell stories about how those values translate to human. Um, so that's, that's an easy way to make sure that they're really a part of the team. 
So what struck me the most, um, everyone, was when, when Michael told me about this, one, that he owned the fact that he came full circle from, like, <laughs> Adam and League and completely owned it. And that's hard to do. It's hard to admit, like, you, they, they, you had the wrong thing going for years and completely reversed once you figured out the value in it. But then also, I immediately said to him, I'm like, oh, is this like knock help desk services? Because that's what you immediately, that's what comes to mind when from the MSP world. And it's not that, because I thought it was something like mission control, that, that sort of, it's not that. This is, they become your employees, essentially. Yeah, they're, they're placed full time as part of your team. We're the employer of record. Mark, yeah. I'm curious how you deal with that. Um, because with the legal, paying the taxes, paying payroll taxes, submitting, doing all of that, giving them the holidays, keeping everything legal that way, that's one of the things we do. So they're legally an employee of ours. We provide them full time. And we do it the same way like all of us do with our with our clients. You know, we present it to our clients that, hey, it's going to be a flat monthly fee regardless. And that way, the price is not going up and down every month. Um, so, Mark, I'm curious how you how you guys are dealing with the legality of the overseas. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if the the legality problems are the same. Sorry, if you heard that, <laughs> someone's got a fast car. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if the legalities are the same in this in the US, but over here, um, it's, we we can we can do that, but uh, we're engaging with them instead as they are technically contractors. We haven't we haven't stepped into that bound, but we don't have a tackle room, but we definitely do everything else that you described. So we treat them like they're part of the team, yep. they're part of the culture. In fact, some of them are over here right now working with the team, um, meeting face to face. That's which awesome. Is really hard to do, but you know, which results in plenty of uh, alcohol as well <laughs> as Scottish culture. Much like the Irish, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as I think, like, you've got to see them as humans. I, I think there's almost the, the, this thing like they're not real people, but I mean they mm-hmm. are. Like that's the thing you have to come get over, uh, and nothing quite does that like seeing them face to face. But yep. a lot of our guys are football fans. Um, they they see each other in the team calls. They speak about what they're doing at the weekend, especially when you're football fans and you and you watch football all over Europe. You know, and you're seeing pictures from your from your work colleagues in different parts of Europe at different yep. football games during the weekend. You really try to breed that culture. But I don't think we're doing quite as good a job as you. But we're not too far away in terms of the approach. The other thing that's fun is we have a memes channel that everybody can post to. <laughs> You know, there, there, have to be, there have to be rules, but yeah, well, it is in teams. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, Lori, funny, yeah. it's funny, the, yeah. one, the, the ones that the South Africans post and the Americans that, so there's some cultural fun things that show up that way too. That's fun. I wrote that down. <laughs> yeah. Now, Lori, you look like you have some thoughts on this and there's remote workers or, or what Michael or, or Mark are talking about. So I've looked into... Uh, working with people from Upwork for different Mm -hmm. smaller tasks. I haven't, uh, I'm a little fearful, uh, like what you were talking about, of hiring someone uh, to even remotely manage even a piece of some of the technologies that we use that connect to our clients' computers. I'm just, you know, how do you verify, you know, that they are who they say they are. I mean, how, how do you verify that they're going to have the skills? Because I've worked with a lot of people here in the United States that I'm assuming they have particular skills because they tout themselves as an expert in a particular area. Yep. And I, I work with them and then I find that they really are not as knowledgeable as I thought that they would be, even though they're one of my peers. So how do you manage some of that? And how do you get outside so of that comfort zone of knowing who you are we have a couple of tests that we have them go through and our clients, we tell them, hey, interview them exactly like you would your own. If you were hiring somebody in the U.S., interview them exactly the same, put them through any of the testing that you want them to. Uh, for us, we do, uh, it's a 90-day probation, so you can kind of test the waters, as it were. Um, basically, everybody, I, I and the other founder, we do the final interviews, so we have a, a a technical recruiter interview, then we do a cultural interview, and then we do the final interview. And that's as an MSP owner, my question is, would I place this person in my business? And if not, they don't make it. So we're we're trying, we cut out 
as much as we can to make sure that the people that are coming forth have have the skill set. But again, testing them, interviewing them, um, it, it's the same way. Yeah, Lonnie, and, I could. Uh, I'm sorry, Michael. Yeah, no, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to add that like, everything that Michael said there is valid. I we actually predominantly did our hours through through Upwork, uh, mm -hmm. Laurie. So I've been I've been on there both as a freelancer and uh, personally and as a on this side of it too. So I can, if you want to have an offline conversation about that, I can definitely help you. Uh, I would like that. I know the last time I posted about a, a particular position that I that I needed some help with, I had someone cut around the line, right? Left the Upwork conversation and found me oh. on LinkedIn and Facebook yeah. and email. And, oh. and I just thought, that's great. Like very, very good, right? He can figure out where I am and, and how to get a hold of me. But for me, I wanted to stay in that Upwork environment because it provided yeah. a safety net of who they are, where they're working, right. I'm gonna review you, I'm gonna pay you. So I thought that was the interesting. The other thing, Lori, is having background checks done. Uh, you want to have an you want to have a background check done through their country. Um, that can be done as well. And the other thing is, we suggest you have a VDI or an RDS desktop for them to log into that's US based and 2FA. So all access, and then have that geofence so that all access to everything in your application. Uh, all you know, so our connect wise, I do all of that is only able to be accessed from those particular locations. So that's also another way to keep your your stuff secured. I like that idea. I didn't think about that. Well, yeah, that's great, everyone. Huge advantage. I can, I can say that as someone who my job has always been remote, um, there's no difference from when I was in mm -hmm. the same geographic area as the team as when I moved to North Carolina. I came on vacation, was staying with a friend and never left. And I just, I called Joe and said, do you care if I live in North Carolina instead of your area? And he said, no, it doesn't matter. And there's no difference mm -hmm. as part of the team, whether I was up there or down here, like it, it can feel the same from the worker's point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, I think that's great. We're at uh, just over an hour. So if anyone had anything to wrap up or they want to throw out there in terms of a pitch or a plug or something like that, please go for it. Um, if anyone wants to be a part of my marketing and communications peer group with Jonathan Crow, uh, find me on LinkedIn. We'll get you into the Slack. And of course, that includes you as well, Tom. We'll make an exception. Gosh, <laughs> I'd like to be in there, yeah. I think Trevor would too, but that's great, everyone. Appreciate you all coming. and. Uh, it would be wonderful. We're going to do this again next month. We'll be putting that on the schedule and make sure everyone's on the original invite. We're going to figure out this issue with Zoom doesn't happen again. But also be on the lookout. I'm going to pull two clips from this and put those up on LinkedIn. And we'll also put it up on the Titan HQ uh, YouTube channel. Okay. And you can post in my group too. Great. Right. I'd, like, I'd like to be in your group. I don't know if you're in my group, but you can join in my group. Maybe uh, maybe maybe Treva can get in touch with you and you can get an email so we get everyone that information. Amazing, for sure. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your time. It's great chatting with you all. We'll hope great, to see you thank next you. Time. And we'll see you at DattoCon. See you soon. Bye, everyone. See you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you.